This is a video about DNA and how it affects color and structure. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of misconception that people have on how these things two relate to each other. Um, and the short answer is that there is no linkage between color and structure in dogs or anything or humans either. So um, we're going to explain why that is. And then we're also going to, at the back end of this, explain why that may not be 100% true. So what, bring this, what brings this up is uh, I'm not a fan of brindle in French Bulldogs, not because I don't think they have good structure and not because I don't like the color. But here you go. Here's a, here's a brindle dog that looks just beautiful. Striped up great structure. And then there's a picture. of a brindle dog that I don't care for the structure in. But that is not because of the structure, is not because of the color. All right, so, um, and so I get bashed for this because I make this, this thing about I'm not a big fan of brindle, and people are not understanding why I'm saying this. And so specifically what I hear people say is, brindle has some of the best structure out there. That is a lack of understanding on how color works to make that statement. But, but I'm going to give you a little understanding how that could be a true statement at the back end of this. All right, so let's talk about how DNA, color, and structure work. All right, every living creature has DNA. DNA is the blueprint that decides what you look like, what I look like, what my wife looks like. It's all about DNA, and the DNA comes from both parents. There's a double strand. Let's just kind of draw it up here. You've got this helix that has proteins that link these two strands together. And there's four different proteins that can be present. There's A, C, G, and T are the four protein, proteins that can be present. And when uh, two, um, two creatures um, procreate, and here's the, other, here's the other partner, when they procreate, these, these two, this strand un uncurls itself, this strand uncurls itself, one strand curls back with the other strand and it makes up new pairings and that what makes up a unique and different creature. All right, so I need to get a, a wipey thing here. So, so the, the important thing here is, is that DNA is the driver of this whole thing. Right, good. And then you've, so how many genes does a dog have? So you've got chromosomes and in those chromosomes there are genes and if you look at gene pairs for a dog, it's about 30,000. 30,000 unique pairings that make up a dog. For a human being, I think it's about 32,000. And by the way, we have some commonality between us and dogs in terms of the genes that we, we, we share. But that's not what we're talking about here. But what we are talking about is there's just an incredible number of these genes that are present, and that's why we're all unique and different. That's why I don't have blue eyes and maybe you do. My wife has blue eyes and uh, uh, her, her daughter does not. Those are under the control of genes. And they also decide why I'm six foot and my wife is five foot. Um, so the question gets to be is, where are these particular genes that control things like eye color and length of your nose and color of your skin and hair color, where are those genes? And the answer is, is they are on very specific loci. So there may be a loci here that is to do with eye color. And by the way, it's gonna be at the same place on other dogs. So this other dog, it's gonna also have this place that is eye color. And when these two unru unravel and get back together again, they get different pairings of DNA depending on what they carry. So there's another one up here that might be to do with leg length. And it's corresponding in the same place on this other DNA strand on all dogs. There may be a number of genes that affect leg length. It may not be a single gene, but it may be a number of genes that all affect leg length. But the point here is, and this is the takeaway, that the gene for leg length has got absolutely zero to do with eye color. They are completely independent genes in different loci and they have got nothing to do with each other at all, ever. So to make a statement that brindle dogs 
have better genetics, better structure, because their brindle is not understanding how genetics work. And that is the point of this video. Now, there are some reasons why that statement might have some truth to it, and now we're going to investigate that. So, but the takeaway on this is, all the genes that make up you, me, and your dogs and your puppies, they have genes, and all of those genes are independent of each other for the most part. You know, if you look at things like tan points, which is, by the way, I'm not crazy about gin, brindle, it's because tan points will get wiped out by the brindle gene. The brindle gene is a dominant gene, a single copy can be expressed, and because of that, dogs that have a brindle gene can interact because they're in the same general loci and interact with things like tan points. So it's, it's a, um, right. So let's get this off the board. So now let's talk about why that statement, that statement could in fact have some truth to it. So the statement is this. The statement is, brindle dogs tend to have better structure than other dogs. Let's say, for instance, um, blue fluffies or blue velvets. They're even more newer. That might well be a true statement, but it's not to do with the color of brindle. It's to do with the size of the genetic pool. So what am I talking about here? So what are the colors that have been around forever in French Bulldogs? Fawns, brindles, creams, and pied variations of those. Those have been around for 100 years or longer. Since the 1800s, the French Bulldog has been around. So we've got, you know, 120, 130 years of Frenchies that have been on this planet. And of course, by the way, all these dogs, every single dog that you can ever look at, if you tra trace its heritage back, it goes back from some ancestral, you know, canine dog from, you know, thousands or maybe 100,000 years ago. Um, and then they've been specifically to enhance particular gene traits to produce the breeds that we now love and enjoy. All right, so, so let's look at a breeding uh, and how this is, how genes work. So we're going to have four dogs, four independent dogs, of which two of them are female, I'll note that in red, and two of them are blue, or males, which we'll denote in blue. And these are the grandparents. So this is, this is a, a pedigree, and we're looking at grandparents here. So this is grand, grandparents. And these dogs got together <clears throat> and produced a dog, and these dogs got together and produced a dog. And these are the parents of the puppy we're going to talk about. These are the parents. And they produced a, now we're going to label these three, now we'll label these five and six. And this, not that the numbers are particularly relevant here, this one is a female and this one is a male. All right, so those are the parents. Those two dogs got together and they produced a puppy. And this is the puppy. And for the sake of argument, we'll call that number seven. Okay, so now the question gets to be, what is the genetic makeup of this dog and where did its genes come from? And the answer is, is it got 25% of its genes from dog one, 25% of its genes from dog two, 25% of its genes from dog three, and 25% of its genes from dog four. So this dog has basically that all of those dogs represent genetic diversity for this puppy. It has a lot of genetic diversity. Great, wonderful. Now, let's take a different scenario here where this dog here had the same grandparents, one and two. Now what happens? Well, the answer is the genetic diversity of this dog is now only 50% from this dog and 50% from this dog. It's actually 25 from this and 25 from this, which makes 50%. 25 from this and 25% this, which makes 50%. So now that dog's genetic diversity just been cut in half. It's got half the genetic diversity that it would have had if it didn't have common grandparents. That's what line breeding and inbreeding does. It reduces genetic diversity. Why is this relevant? Because if you look at new breeds that are coming out, uh, in Frenchies, for instance, you know, like pinks or huskies. These are limited gene pools. There's not that many dogs to breed to. There will be 10 years from now, but this year there aren't. It's a small gene pool. So what happens? 
This is what happens. People are breeding back dogs that are directly related or closely related, which reduces genetic diversity in the offspring. And that can then become a big problem. So let's investigate why that would be a problem. Just to give you a little insight into this, I'll give you one that's actually to do with human beings. So that we've done inbreeding in human beings, particularly in the royal lineage in Europe, the Hasbergs would be a great example of this. So why do they do this? The Hasbergs uh, didn't want you and me and other commoners to be part of their clique. So they then intermarried and they didn't have a big gene pool. So then daughters married, uh, were, were uh, married to uncles and uh, things like this were happening. And it produced, at the end of this, for the Habsburg, was Charles II, who was so badly deformed that the guy couldn't even procreate. Uh, his chin was completely misshapen. He had all kinds of problems. I think he had one testicle that was very small. I mean, I don't know the details on that. But the point here is that was a disaster for the Habsburgs because they insisted on doing this, this intermarriage interbreeding. So what is going on? Why is this a problem? Well, here's the answer to this. Let's go back to this DNA strand. And just to kind of give you a, a kind of a backstory to this, the problem is this. You, my friend, have got some disastrous DNA lurking in your DNA strands. Horrible, terrible stuff that will cause misery and death to your offspring. I have it too. My wife has it as well. But with any luck, it's in different places and those pairings don't match up. And so Although I may be a carrier of something terrible like Huntington's disease, my wife is unlikely to have Huntington's disease. And since it is what's called a recessive gene, takes two copies, it is never expressed in the children. The children may be carriers of it, but they're not afflicted by it. And that's how DNA lets you escape from these terrible things unless you start having a small gene pool. And then you start to have matches of these really bad DNA traits that cause havoc and disaster within that particular line. So let's, let's take an example here. So here is two creatures, and we're going to make the blue the really bad DNA in this particular locus. And this is the normal gene, it's the red. And we're going to call this, um, we're just going to call this B for bad. So a dog that ends up being red, red, is bad. A dog that ends up being blue blue is not bad at all, has no bad in it at all, and a dog that ends up having one copy of it, which would be red blue or blue red, is a dog that has one copy of it. All right, so we're now going to do a Punnett square to show what goes on. So we're just going to get this off the board so that we don't lose room here. So here we go, here's the Punnett square. And what we're going to have is we're going to show you a couple of different scenarios. A normal pairing where one of the parents has nothing to do with that bad gene. And one parent, unknowns to them, inherited it from one of their ancestors and they have this bad gene here. The Punnett square shows us what's going to happen. We'll have these half puppies, half of the litter, has nothing to do with the bad gene at all. They will never pass that on to any of their offspring. Versus this bottom set here, which is the other half, they are carriers. They pass it on, but the puppies are unafflicted by it. So everything's fine. Here comes the problem. We take one of these puppies and breed it back to another dog that also has, because it may be an offspring, also inherited this nasty gene. What's going to happen? So here we go. So this dog here, both dogs, neither of them are afflicted by it, but they both carry a copy of it. What's going to happen? Well, that dog there, one quarter litter, no problems at all, will never, never inherited it, it will never pass it on. This dog here and this dog here, that's a half half of the offspring. They're carriers, but they won't be afflicted by it. And bang, right there is the problem. One quarter of the litter is a disaster for that one quarter. That they have this two copies, it expresses itself, and there is the problem. So 
This is why we get into trouble when we're talking about small genetic pools, which might be velvets, that might be these new fans. They don't have an enormous gene pool, and so people start doing line breeding. Nothing illegal about line breeding. The AKC has no say in this. They're not going to restrict you from doing it. They're not going to say you can't have a litter and register it. They have no concerns to them whatsoever at all. They don't even know about it. And you may not know about it because this may be, you know, it's a lot of these genes, we don't test for them. I mean, what can you test for on a French bulldog or a dog? Basically color, that's about it. You can't test for other very, I mean, there are some things in the health panel, you've got a four panel or a five panel health panel, so you can test for some of these things. But for the majority of these things, they're lurking in there and you have no idea who has them. And the only time you know that they're there is when they express themselves and they actually the dog or puppy suffers from it. So if you make the statement that brindle dogs produce on average healthier dogs than, for instance, the new fads, that is definitely a true statement. But the, but I, the point you want to understand is it has absolutely nothing to do with color. Color is not going to cause an issue here. It's other things. So, you know, if you go back 10 years ago when blues are coming out, people said, oh, blue dogs, they have terrible skin problems. They may have had skin problems because there was genetic, uh, lack of genetic diversity that caused a problem with allergies or whatever. But it wasn't because they're blue dogs, and it never was, and it never will be. And likewise, brindle dogs are not inherently more healthy dogs because they're brindle compared to fluffies or brindle fluffies or non-brindle dogs. There is no difference at all. But there might be a difference in the gene pool, and that could show other issues where these unknown recessive genes crop up and cause problems. That's it. Enjoy your dogs. Hey, I love brindles. Don't get me wrong here. No, I'm not, and never knocking brindles. Never have. Uh, nothing wrong with brindles at all. It's just if you want to produce 10 points, they wipe 10 points out. That's it. Thanks for watching. See ya.